student generation uh, to make to you an apology. Because many of the people uh, of my generation expected to leave you with a far better, better uh, university and city and nation and world than what we have. Many of, us, <coughs> many of us lived and worked and sacrificed and went to jails and prisons in order to witness to the fact that we can have social change that is meaningful and that can encompass all of us in this country and can encompass all of humanity. While there are notable achievements that we can offer, my own sense is that in critical fashions we have failed. Our nation is not what the nation might have been with different direction. And the movement of which I was a part and uh, often a strategist uh, did not produce the people of the land that I want. But one of the things that can be said is that this kind of a gathering at Cal State is a consequence of the struggle of the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and beyond. This kind of group could not have gathered at this university, would not have gathered at this university, at many other universities across the country in 1955 or even 1965. Still, however, on behalf of Rosa Parks and Eleanor Roosevelt and Oscar Romero and a, a huge host of all sorts of people around the world as well as of the United States, uh, on their behalf, my behalf, I apologize to you who are the students at this university. The fourth question I ask is, why are you at CSUN? Um, and I speak mostly to now students. Why are you here at this university? You may have already made that decision, but let's acknowledge there are many different answers, no doubt. Let's acknowledge that your parents and family and extended family would have their views of why you should be here. Um, I don't know how many of you are here because you hope that a college degree will be a, a gateway to getting um, financially secure and wealthy. Um, but I want to say that you do not need a university certification to steal, period. You, can do that without a college degree. The Chamber of Commerce has, across our country, all sorts of educational committees now in which their short-term and long-term goal is to control education, control the university on behalf of what I call plantation capitalism, mm -hmm. fundamentally. There are those in the business community who insist that business has made this nation great. I disagree with that. I think we the people have made this nation great. And chew on how you use your CSUN years, which can be some of the best years of your life, no matter what hard work you may have, no matter what financial struggles you may have to have. But I want to push you at the point that you use your CSUN years um, in order to glad, grab hold of your life. And I want to use your years as some of the freest years that you have, no matter what struggle you may have had. And many, many millions of us have had struggles all across our life. In order to get through college, I went at midnight to the Cleveland, Ohio airport uh, and worked uh, my senior year from uh, 2 a.m. to about 7 a.m. loading uh, cargo onto uh, 
airplanes, and we didn't have any carts. We carried the, we carried the stuff up into the plane, into the planes. So a life for me has always been something of a struggle. But and I know that's increased for some of you in the light of what we have mismanaged our Cali the state of California and our nation. But whatever the struggle, the struggle, you will be surprised. The struggle will cause you to call upon resources you never knew you had, and energy and strength beyond your imagination. So the, the struggle itself can be a sign of the gift of your life. We as a nation are in sheer chaos, chiefly because too many of us, 300 million of us, too many of us, are more shaped and formed by historic racism, sexism, violence, as well as by war, by, not simply violence, but the violence of war as well, by plantation capitalism, which is greed and materialism. Too many of us have been shaped by that, these elements rather than by equality, liberty, and justice for all. Too many of us support it, taking the land from the Mexicans. Too many of us support it, slavery for 250 years in the aftermath of slavery. Too many of us supported the notion that women should be submissive to men, should not be allowed to be educated or allowed to go to university and the like. But racism, as an illustration, um, representative of, of these other isms that I've lifted up, takes a kind of a two-fold uh, push on us. In the first instance, racism like sexism and violence and greed has a spiritual poison that pretends that some human beings deserve mistreatment, deserve to be dead. Uh, social change requires that we con confront people who carry on the attitudes that various people should not be, should not be treated equally in the like, but then also to get at the political, economic, social, cultural structures that try to keep the spiritual poison in place and that continues to teach it. Uh, so that, uh, it, it's not enough for us to simply say that there is no such thing in the sight of God an illegal human being, an illegitimate human being, an undocumented human being. We have to also try to get our society to take responsibility for doing the paperwork that should have been done a decade ago to help the vast numbers of folk that we're calling illegitimate uh, 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 residents of our society so that they, they would have the papers they need. I have a very important thesis that whatever are the social, economic, political problems, they are not, uh, they can be solved. We can be healed of them. We can be changed. But we cannot be changed if we do not make a proper assessment of where we are and what those problems are. Deny, as so many in our midst, and so many rather in our land, do the existence of racism and will never resolve it. Deny the presence of violence. How can you? And we'll never put it on the table and walk around it and brainstorm it and see what it is where dealing with and see what now confronts us. Of our own forms of tyranny, then we are in danger of becoming a, democrat, a, a more democratic society. Why do we, 300 million people, through our governments, but especially through our national government, think that our safety and security relies upon nearly 800 military bases in 130 
countries in the world today with troops on the ground in Colombia and Yemen and Somalia maybe one or two others but then our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan with a trillion dollars already spent in the Afghan war and almost a trillion already in Iraq but with an annual budget from uncommitted <coughs> funds of our taxes of a trillion dollars a year just through the Pentagon and when there's talk about financial crunch and being in debt, there is no discussion about the fact that the largest form of our deficit is because of our military spending over the last 20, 30 years. 42 cents uh, on the dollar of what we pay for interest uh, the federal government pays for interest on our loans, 42 cents on the dollar, is what China uses from the loans that they have loaned us in order to uh, 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 finance their own fairly limited military. 42 cents on a dollar. The interest that we in the United States pay uh, goes to, it, it, to China uh, is what they use for their limited military expenditures. Who is it that we fear? Is the fear really of ourselves? Uh, since when are the poor countries of the world where we fought our wars? Uh, a danger to us. I mentioned 800 military installations, but I want to also mention the fact that no country, in, no empire ever in history has had navies in every ocean, has had air fleets assigned to every section of the world has seven military commands that cover the whole earth. The most recent command was announced in 2008-2009 called the AFRICOM. Its headquarters temporarily are in Germany because no country in Africa yet has consented to allowing us to build our AFRICOM command center and headquarters in Africa. But we are building and plan to build military bases all down the east coast of Africa. A few Americans even see this anywhere. It's not examined. But it represents the United States continuing to want to be the superpower, the only superpower, and that is in control of the rest of the world and that militarily has no match. So I, I will push very hard in the dialogue to get you to examine carefully, not violent theory and practice which I taught from 1958 all across the southeastern part of our country in the movement and in crisis situations. And finally, let me say this. I am enthusiastic about CSUN, where you had such massive activity last year, I understand, on a whole variety of issues. And I think the university is the place where we can learn how to go after solving social issues, political issues, and acting upon them. There is more activism today in the United States than I have ever imagined. 
It is in the university. It's in our communities. More issues are being raised by all sorts of people. But it's my contention that because we have not given our time to listening to the experience of nonviolent struggle, that our activism oftentimes does not accomplish what we would like to accomplish. So as we begin this dialogue around civil discourse, and social change, I invite you, most of all, to consider the possibility that there is a power of nonviolent struggle and conflict that we have not tapped, that has resources straight back in human history all the way, that has been codified by Gandhi in the 20th century, that if we begin to look at it and study and strategize from it, we will be astonished at what our energy personally and together can effect. <laughs>